oil, water, soil and food are becoming very uncertain resources in the near future. And we can build them all into human settlements if we want to. Or we can build settlements uh, which take no account of any of these human needs. On one side of the road is a rather bare subdivision and on this side of the road is village homes. Village Homes was the first and is probably still the best developed attempt at an ecological village and it's in the city of Davis in the United States. It's really extremely simple but extremely sophisticated at once. It was designed by Michael Corbett. The houses are very close together east-west, they're just uh, maybe 20 feet apart. But each row of houses sit on a rise on either side of a, a hollow. And the hollow is called a swale. It was Mike Corbett who revived that name from the old English. And so all water off the roof, all water off the roads and the paths run into the swales all the year and is absorbed. And I think the figures for the first few years went, we got a foot of water absorbed and then we got about two and a bit feet, I think, and then 17 feet in the third year. So that uh, once you've got 17 feet of water, saturation under here, you know you can grow trees without additional watering once their roots are down. So most of these trees are on the water from the swales and then many of the trees are food bearing trees along the little public paths. This is a jujube which naturally dries on the tree. It's a Chinese date. This is a good one um, and you can store this as long as you like. I've been eating one or two and keeping the pips. But, uh, yeah, this was a pretty good one. Here in the uh, settlement, as the trees have grown, the houses have also grown in value. Till now, they're worth five times their original cost. But just over the fence, there are houses that look like the American dream with swimming pools, lawns, dogs and garages. But the owners have to pay energy costs and all their food costs. And so their houses are worth 30% less now than the houses in village homes. Throughout village home there are strips of public open space. And this one's all planted to fruit trees. It's pomegranates and citrus, mulberries and grapes. And there's enough grapes for people to make, for the public to make wine, really, and for the public to eat grapes. So, um, this there's a high density, you've got to remind yourself all the time here, that we're in a high density settlement. And the food is just, uh, really, it's a hand's reach away. So, uh, you know, all the costs of transport are gone, all the costs of wastage is gone. People here can make their own wines, they make their own tacos from the corn, and uh, some people here grow more and sell it. So some, some people here can make their living from growing or preserving food. It just makes a lot of common sense. This place only gets 18 inches of rain, and anybody would classify that as dry. But this town is cool, lush, and green. In all western cities, a fortune is spent on stormwater drains to export the clean rainwater out of the settlement. But here the water is soaked into the ground, and the money saved is spent on trees. Last year, they sold seven tons of almonds, for example, and the money goes to maintaining the gardens. When I was working in South Melbourne, the city engineer said to me, we well, were always taught never to plant useful trees in public open space. And he said, and now I wonder why we were taught that. And of course, when you see public open space full of useful trees, we must all wonder why we don't do it, because every city in the world can provide its own food at a very low cost. in village homes, I met an old, old friend, David Katz. He and his wife, Karen, and their kids have been here from the very beginning. Can't move from here because the kids don't want to leave. And it's, it's a great neighborhood for kids. Uh, it's nice to have a place where the, uh, there's, there's real neighborhood, there's other people 
looking after the kids or aware of what's going on, and the kids could go out the door from their wee toddlers on up and, and make their own friends and really control their own life to a great degree that we don't have to, you don't have to worry about them and run their life as much and makes it things easier for us and it's a lot better for them. It's been really fun because um, there's no through traffic and you can play in the streets and there's lots of, there's lots of fruit so there's like almost something, um, something on the trees all, all year long so like summer there's peaches and during the fall there's pomegranates and grapes and it's been, that's been fun and it's also been fun just to have the like big green fields and being able to go chasing the grapevines and also just being able to ride away and go downtown. They know the whole place so much better than we do. They know everyone's, uh, what everyone's backyard is like, where their gates are, how the windows work and where the, uh, uh, the secret spots are. They play tag for hours, even the big ones do. Um, and no one can find them there. And I, I imagine every kid around here has gotten involved in, in uh, the commerce of the place in terms of the little girls in the neighborhood. There are only five or six, there's three or four that pick little bouquets and uh, pedal them door to door, just uh, for mostly, I think, for the fun of it. And there's just uh, such a cornucopia of fruit and all this other stuff that I think it's occurred to all of them one time or another to try to do something with it. Uh, they get a real appreciation for it and actually uh, know a ripe fruit from one that's not and, and uh, develop a surprising knowledge about all these kinds of plants and they don't, they're not even aware of it. And, uh, so that's nice too. You know, but the one thing we never really appreciated was the fact of how much freedom we got out of the situation. Um, just like right now, uh, extremely uh, beautiful house. It's cool, there's not much noise gets in there, and uh, I have permission to go walk on the roof, which is great. Mm. Well, this is, here I am at the chimney of Jim and Donna's house, you know. This is the sort of roof I really like. It, it's always pretty, but it never needs painting. It's always uh, different colours with the flowers and the foliage. And it's, uh, Donna's down there, but she can't really hear me up here, so it's pretty soundproof. Uh, and I remember this when it was a short herb garden. Now it's looking like a forest, seven years later. The houses here are built to be energy efficient. The whole settlement's built to be energy efficient. Here, the windows to the south, the solar windows, are shaded this time of year both by grapes and by awnings, so we don't get a lot of direct sunlight and heat in when we don't want it. Well, soon it'll be winter, and the sun goes low, comes through these windows, and falls on these uh, innocuous blocks, which are actually steel tanks, which will be filled with water come the winter, and they'll absorb the heat and radiate it at night into the living area and a kitchen area and out here. So everything's quite passive. In this sort of environment, it's typical for the envelope of the house to merge into the garden almost uh, without any abrupt gradation. So you're sort of inside, partly outside, outside, and uh, you know, most of the things around us out here are food anyhow. Almost an economic botanical garden here. We have plums, cherries, grapes, peaches, pomegranates, citrus, quinces, uh, what else? 
Well, it's just an off and I can see a banana, like passion fruits. Quinces, for instance, you never cook a rabbit without you use a quince. I can see a rhinoceros. <laughs> This home's a bit of a trap for me. I think I've been here every year since it was built and I wasted thousands of, of films on it because it, it's just the best thing since sliced bread. I, it's the nicest place, I think, in the world for human settlements. 